and welcome to Fiction Fans, a podcast where we read books and other words too. I'm Lily. And I'm Sarah. And today with us, we have Connor Kaplan, author of The Sword in the Street. Welcome. Hi. It's so great to have you here. It is. Good to be here. Well, let's kick things off with something great that happened recently. Sarah? I uh, didn't actually prepare a good thing that happened this week. I'm not <laughs> sure. I'm sure that good things happened this week. I'm just not sure what, the, what they were. Mine is just that I tried a new recipe and it was awesome. Yeah. So that's always fun. That sounds delightful. I mean, mine was just like my birthday. That was on Friday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. That's totally a great thing. Yeah, that, that definitely yeah. counts. <laughs> yeah, I had one of the best chocolate cakes of my life. It had like pudding down the center and everything. Uh, I loved it so much. <laughs> you kept you kept posting pictures of it on Twitter, and it was very rude because I wanted it. <laughs> yeah, I had a whole countdown till it vanished. It was great. I don't regret it. Mm, never regret cake. It looked delightful. Awesome. It looked like very good cake. It was it was inspiring, honestly. <laughs> so, Lily, what are you drinking today? I am drinking pineapple cider from Ace. I got a variety pack because I needed pear cider for aforementioned recipe mm. and now i'm just stuck with pineapple cider and it's not a problem at all the horror <laughs> connor do you have a beverage with you today i made peach green tea specifically because i knew we were going to be recording <laughs> smart also that sounds amazing it really does it's delicious it's magical it's like something a disney princess would drink <laughs> Is it hot or iced? I feel like that would taste good both ways. I had it hot, which was probably a mistake considering my air conditioner broke early today. <gasps> oh no! I am just oh, no. stewing in here, but I, I can't resist the taste. <laughs> well, hopefully you don't melt halfway through this recording. Sarah, how about you? I'm also drinking tea. I have half a bottle of wine in my refrigerator, but I wanted to save that for Wheel of Time, which I'll be reading tonight, because I think that I need to drink a little bit of something to get me through Wheel of Time. Oh, which book are you on? I'm on book 12. I'm about halfway through. I forgot how many there were. Like 17 or something. <laughs> 14. I thought 12 was going to be the last book. And there are even more than I thought there were. They're yeah. multiplying. There's 14 plus a prequel novel. I've already read the prequel, so I don't have to worry about that. I just have two and a half books left. I started reading these in like November, I want to say. October, November. And... How, how did you get through them that fast? <laughs> That's so many pages. It would be a lot sooner, except that then we started this podcast and I had to <laughs> like stop reading because I had other things to read. That's incredible and also a little horrifying that you're able <laughs> to get through it that fast. I mean, like, I wish I could, but also how? I'm just a really fast reader, but don't ask me how well, like, I internalized what happened or any of the names. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I got through like I think the first three and then I can't remember why I stopped but I know it took me like six months to get through three of them. They can be a little rough. I mean I actually started reading the series. I read the first two books I want to say about 10 years ago and then never like never finished. That's fair. Yeah. I think I last picked them up in high school or something so that might have explained a lot. <laughs> mm-hmm. I discovered that I own the first one. You do? Yeah. <laughs> they just snuck in there. I Maybe they're like gnomes and they just appear when you least expect it. They're multiplying. Well, how does a book that big sneak up on you? By keeping terrible track of my books. <laughs> That's so fair. Well, speaking of, read anything good lately? Sarah, you sort of answered. Yeah, I haven't had any chance to read anything non-podcast related because it's only been like five days since we recorded the last podcast. So I, I just finished The Dragon of Jin Saiyang by K.S. Vioso, who's like the greatest character writer of all time. It was phenomenal, and I needed like a week to recover from it. <laughs> okay, it's it's like the third book in a trilogy, and it sort of caps everything out. You, you really need to start with book one, because it's technically just one big story. Mm -hmm. But like, she's just phenomenal at like, it's in first person and the amount of stuff she's able to do with it is just is just fantastic because like everything all the way down to her thoughts and all the way out into the world is just a reflection of the internal state of the main character and it's just absolutely phenomenal. That sounds really good. I could gush about it for days. <laughs> I've heard such good things about the series. I think I own the first book and I just haven't had the, the chance to read it yet, but it's, it's definitely on my TBR because it sounds really, really good. 
It's it's so good. There's there's a thing that happens in book three that almost makes it into like it gets almost meta in a way that I wasn't expecting it to, but it, like it it works by like I don't know if it, it was even intentional. It works by like not even calling a lot of attention to itself. It's it's really really good. It was I was expecting it to to be phenomenal, and then like I read it and it, and it blew all of that out of the water. It was it was like <laughs> one of the best books I've read in a long time. That's amazing. Just having expectations going into a book can affect your experience of it so much. You know, even if it's yeah. a good book and you expect something great, that can end up being disappointing. So when it's the other way around, it like that's I don't great. think it's ever happened to me on that scale before, honestly. Yeah. Like I've never gone in with such high expectations and still been like son of a bitch. She she actually topped him. <laughs> How did she do that? <laughs> That is high praise. It sounds like Sarah knows what you're talking about, so we might have to put that on the list soon. Because I we should. <laughs> it's it's also the series is called Chronicles of the Bitch Queen, right? Yeah, yeah. And I just really like that title. It really the main sort of thesis. It's like this meditation on the fantasy genre's relationship to royalty and the inherent injustice of having that much power. And so it's just like this person is a queen. So everything's going to go wrong for her because you can't have that much responsibility without everything going wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's no way for that to happen. And it's just, it's fantastic. I love it so much. (laughs) Awesome. Have you read anything lately? Oh, I was just going to use that to skip over my embarrassing (laughs) lack of answer. (laughs) I was hoping the momentum would just carry us through. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) No. (laughs) Uh, we recorded our last episode four days ago, and I am editing. <laughs> That's fair. I read it like a criminally slow pace. I get through like a book, regardless of length, I'll get through it in like probably around a month and a half to two months. Mm-hmm. So it's an extremely slow process. So I get it. I, I have trouble starting <laughs> books. Like once I have started it, I can read it pretty fast, but I will go... <laughs> before I created a podcast to force myself to read, I would go months having a book on my bedside table that I wanted to pick up and I just couldn't start it. I, I had no idea other people actually did that. I have the exact same problem. It's yeah. more of like a pacing thing for me. Like I will get through 5% of a book and then I will put it down fully intending to pick it up in like 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. And then I just don't. If I can actually pick it up, and read it I can get going and read through like another five percent of it or whatever in like not a lot of time but it's the actual process of picking it up and reading it it's like what can I get over that hump oh absolutely yeah I'm Mm -hmm. completely in the same boat there (laughs) the trick I have learned is force your cousin to start a twitter account publicizing your reading (laughs) schedule and then you are uh Guilty. obligated to yeah. read <laughs> your honor bound exactly i think you i think what you mean is guilt your cousin into starting a twitter account <laughs> well it worked is all i'm saying <laughs> it did work <laughs> But moving on to the book that we are actually here to talk about today, the very good Sword in the Street. I always want to call it the Sword in the Stone. I'm not, I'm going to do my best not to, <laughs> but if I, okay. if I do, apologies in advance. It's better than the alternative, which, which I got like after, like, I, I wish I had realized it when I was coming up with titles. But it was only after someone posted a, a picture of the cover, someone commented, I hear the sequel is a dagger in the sheets. <laughs> and I was just like, I can't believe I never thought of that. I'm so upset. <laughs> that kind of ties into the question that I was going to ask, though, which is I think that I saw on Twitter back before we were really like as good Twitter friends and actual yeah. friends that you had initially been planning on this to be a series but it's now a standalone, right? Yeah, that's a bit of a long story. It was actually, it went through like a whole process that started in like October of 2019 when I got like the first draft done in like 14 days, like non-consecutively. That was just the only thing I was doing. And then I had to cut that. Uh, I got had to cut the second half of it and then rewrite the ending. And when I was doing that, I don't want to spoil the the ending at this point, 
That's for later. I thought it was going to end the way it actually ends up ending at that point. And then I got to the end and it, the original way I wrote it was the opposite of what happens in the final product. And it ended on a bit of a cliffhanger that set up a book two. And I shipped it off to my editor and I wrote, I like planned out and wrote, I think a version of book two in like 28 days. And then my editor got back to me and said, I think this would be a lot stronger as a standalone. And originally I went through a couple of days where I was like, what does he know? Come on, I don't need to do a stand. It, what? No, it's fine as it is. And then three days later, I was like, damn it, he's actually right. It's <laughs> got to be a standalone. It works so much better that way. Um, and so I like wrapped it up and tied it off and everything and made it a standalone. But I still had this idea. I, I'm only just debuting now. And I thought that what you're supposed to, like, what I'm supposed to do a series, that's like what you do when you write fantasy. And I'm sure I can come up with a book two idea eventually. And so far, it's just sort of failed to materialize. I've taken like a couple shots at it over, um, I think since um, around September of last year, I've had like three or four completely different, like wildly different first drafts and none of them have really worked the way I need them to. And I, this is part of why I like the idea of making it a standalone is like, for now, that book can just be there. And if I can come up with a good enough idea that is worthy of a book too, I can eventually write that. But for now, it'll just be standalone. So when you say second book, you mean specifically in this series, not just a second book for you? Oh, yeah. But I'm, okay. I'm working on a thing now, but it's not related. Like, it's not in that world. Gotcha. You mentioned that your original idea for the ending ended up being sort of the ending for this book. So did you just sort of you know, condense down the overall plot you were thinking for the series into one book? Or what was that like? The first draft was just wildly different from the, mm. uh, second, dra the second draft and everything that came after that. I think the first draft, first of all, I'm, I'm giving very short dates for like how, how quickly I was finishing them. That's because they're, they're like 60,000 words. I'm not writing like any 800 page monstrosities here, but like the first draft was almost as different to the final product as it's possible to be. So it was like 60,000 words, about 80% fight scene, <laughs> about as different as the first draft is able to be. I think there are maybe two scenes that are from the first draft that made it into the, the final version. It changed radically. The original version, it's going to sound cool. I promise it was trash. <laughs> it was like, it was only John's point of view. It was written in first person Edwin was kind of in it, but it was like a wildly different version of him with a couple of the same bits of dialogue. He was in like a polyamorous relationship and was part of a group of newspaper editors trying to take down an oligarchy. And there was a climax involving like a four-way sword fight in a bear pit with a bear, which sounds cool, but was not on the page. <laughs> It does sound very cool. I am trying to find a way to work that into a future project because I love it in concept. The execution was not good. It was a first draft. <laughs> so like I got to the end and I, I really tried to keep what I had there. But the more I tried to edit it, the more I was like, all right, the latter sort of th 30,000 words really needs to go. And then I had to really take a hard look at like, what does this character want and what does he need? I approach a lot of writing almost like a math equation where it's like I need to plug in a specific sort of emotional proof to create a sort of satisfactory sort of narrative. And I realize zeroing in on a lot of the sort of financial trouble could make for a better core of the book. And the changes I made as a result of that are sort of why the book kind of reads almost like a Russian nesting doll of plot where it's just this <laughs> thing happens and the effect turns into, oh, now the story's about this. And then another thing happens and it's like, oh, the actual story is contained in the next one. It's very weirdly structured just due to the way it ended up getting written. It's so interesting you say that because indeed, most of my sort of stream of conscious notes that I was taking while I was reading it was about how we may overuse the word relatable, but <laughs> I definitely recognize those struggles of trying to make rent, feeling like you finally have money, and then realizing you have a car payment. Those are extremely familiar issues 
to be exploring in this world that is not familiar. And so sort of having that lifeline to the characters and to the story structure was really helpful. I think my stream of consciousness was just, oh no, John, you idiot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. which, which Connor got a lot of because I live streamed, live tweeted my reading to him. It was delightful, honestly. <laughs> I loved it. There was not a there was not a lot of deep literary analysis though. It was just, oh no. Oh no, I, I, I that's that's what I'm here for, honestly. Like I feed off of the fuck yous and everything and just all <laughs> just cursing me out and everything. I love that. It keeps me young. You mentioned that the plot changed pretty drastically. One of the things that we were delighted by was how vague the magic system is in this novel. And so I was wondering if it was always that way or if that was also something that changed as you edited the story. That was something that tied in a bit more with the whole sort of idea of um, narratives as almost like a math equation with blurry edges and everything. Mm -hmm. It's like if you looked at a bunch of apples, like that seems like five. It's like that's that's what writing is to me. Because <laughs> you you just don't question it. You just try and like plug something in and hope it works. And originally, so originally the story had no magic, and I didn't see any reason to include it because I couldn't find a way to justify why it needed to be there in order to have the story that I wanted to write. And then around this time, I had um stumbled into a lecture I think done by Grant Morrison a comics writer on this thing called chaos magic which is basically what I used for the book I ripped it mm -hmm. off wholesale there are a couple of lines that are almost like entirely stolen from, stolen from other people who are a lot smarter than I am in the explanations for like how it works mm -hmm. um and then I just put my own spin on that sort of dialogue and then I did some digging. I found out that Alan Moore as well was really into that sort of thing. Um, and one of the things he emphasized when, he, when talking about it is that the way that they believe magic to work is to be like a process of communication that's tied to storytelling. And the more I listened to it, the more I was like, I could actually use this. If I just put this in the book, I can just sort of interweave a lot of thoughts on storytelling and philosophy that I want to talk about anyway. I can just, I have a thinly failed excuse to talk about <laughs> philosophy. But then the more I thought about it, the more I was just sort of, I realized as an autistic person, communication is generally like one of the biggest points in any relationship and zeroing in on a magic system that centers so heavily on like precise communication as this way of almost making micro tears in the fabric of reality mm -hmm. was something that I really thought would work really well. And I could like sort of weave it into the structure of the book to emphasize a lot of points I already wanted to make. I think one of my favorite things about it is that overall, I wasn't convinced that magic was real because you can have characters that believe in magic. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, I'm, I'm not actually sure if they are performing magic or if they just believe in it, which is a really fun line that you don't see played with very often, or at least I don't. Yeah, it's that part. I had been in like the like couple, there were a couple of months before I actually sat down to write it where someone was encouraging me to read a lot of uh, Guy Gabriel K, where he does a lot of that sort of thing. Uh, the whole quarter turn to the fantastic that he does, mm -hmm. where you'll, he'll take like ancient beliefs and it'll be like, in this world, they're real so that no one can read it like they would a historical novel and go like, oh, how quaint. Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to sort of do the opposite of take something that was not quite rooted in history, tell you it's real, but never give you any evidence to the point where you, you I want you to be able to ask if it matters whether or not it's real, almost. Mm -hmm. Where it's like, whether or not it's real, they, they it's clearly working for whatever they've got going on. And that's also, I mean, one of the interesting things about chaos magic as practiced in our world. Yeah. At, at, to some extent, it is just a meditation focus. Yeah. <laughs> and so if you're just focused on the outcome you want, it's you're more likely to get it just because that's how people work. Yeah. And so it was, you go where your attention goes. Exactly. I loved it. Something else that is quite prevalent in the book, though, is fencing. And... There were a lot of fencing terms. Like, do you do you fence, or did you have to look up all of these fencing terms? 
I I had to do a lot of research. I am hopelessly uncoordinated. I could I could never I could never actually fence. A lot of this is stuff I picked up over the years. I think around 2013, I found an interest in basically sword YouTube, where a bunch of YouTubers like just sort of buy swords and test them out and just talk about, I guess, historical European martial arts, I think is the term for it. Mm-hmm. And I would watch a lot of those videos, especially when I was in college a lot and had a lot more free time and stuff. And there's just a bunch of stuff that I would um, notice without necessarily knowing I was sort of taking it in. And a lot of that came in handy where I would need to have a sword fight and I'd know some sort of basic mechanics from a video I watched a couple of years ago. And then the rest of it was I read a manuscript on Venetian rapier by... Um, I'm definitely going to mispronounce this. It's Nicoletto Giganti. I think he's an Italian or maybe Venetian. Who's to say? Scientists have yet to agree. <laughs> he did. He wrote a manuscript on how to use, I think, a 15th century rapier, because that's going to look a bit different than, I think, stuff that would come later. Everyone had different terms for the precise measurements that would work for them. Mm-hmm. And so I read that, took a couple key phrases that, will, that would make me sound like I knew what I was talking about and threw that in. And then as like a final flourish, I just decided to build in this idea of showmanship being part of the fight so that I wouldn't get anyone tweeting at me saying that like no one would do this in an actual fight. <laughs> because I could I could then like I could brush that away being like, ah, but you see the fights that were a show the whole time. So they actually had to do that. <laughs> I really liked that aspect of the book. We should we give a high level synopsis for people listening? <laughs> we, yes, probably we should. I think usually we do that a little sooner, but we got carried away. <laughs> That's all right. It's too exciting to have Connor on. <laughs> <laughs> this book follows, oh, I would say two main characters yeah. John, a sword fighter, and Edwin, a student. And it takes place in a world where, well, almost all industry, all all people have to have a patron in order to do their work. And so John works for a lordess and he does sword fighting in duels in order to entertain or solve disagreements or whatever else the lordess asks him to do it for. And the story overall sort of delves into the inherent power imbalance between a patron and their employee but then also the relationship imbalances between John and Edwin. Yeah, you've got people using swords in this sort of trial by battle to decide a lot of stuff with legislation. John sort of exploring the lack of the lack of agency that, that comes with having to toe the, the line with this person has so much more power than him, who can bend the rules as she sees fit without much recourse. And then Almost as a contrast to that, you have Edwin who's going and out and he's sort of developing and learning about legislation in the interest of changing it and to fix that inherent injustice. And the tension sort of comes uh, like as they navigate the world's differences, they also have to navigate their own in a way. The relationship between the main characters and sort of how that grows and changes was definitely one of my favorite parts, but we cannot talk about it until the spoiler (laughs) section, so I'm going to not. (laughs) But we we sort of hinted at this earlier, but this book is in very close third person, sort of bouncing back and forth between John and Edwin. And they have extremely different narration styles and thought processes. What was it like having to switch between these two characters while you were writing this book? Oh God, John was so much easier. He gave me such an easier time of it. Honestly, because he was not like me. Mm -hmm. And so like, I almost was taking a page from Margaret Atwood's book in a way where like, he's this person who's inevitably failing to live up to the ideals of what his society tells him men are supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And then just having to navigate that frustration without necessarily having the capacity to really think about that too hard. His headspace is, was really direct, and he just sort of gave me everything immediately, and I could he, he would just go. Edwin was by far a lot harder to write because his dysfunction was very autobiographical, which meant I needed to be honest. I had like this sort of responsibility to portray what I needed to portray accurately and correctly, but also in a way that a reader who has never been in that sort of headspace would be able to understand what was going on and make it make sense. 
I think a beautiful irony in in the dialogue of this book were characters calling Edwin simple when he was actually the most complex of the two. It was very clear to me as the reader, and it, but it's that constant diatribe of he's the simple one. It was like, no. Nah. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't communicate as much what's going on under the surface or, or more, a better way of phrasing that would be that he's more aware of what's going on under the surface. Not that he's good at navigating it, but like he knows that it's there and knows how his dysfunction works itself in him. And I never knew whether or not I was doing that well throughout the whole process. By the time I was publishing it, I was just sort of hoping that it would work. I didn't really have a lot of beta readers. So I was just like, I need to trust that I know what I'm talking about when I write about my own head. So I just hope for the best. I found Edwin to be very relatable. Like I haven't... um I can never remember if it's sympathize or empathize. Uh, empathize. Yeah, okay. that's the word. I can't say that I've experienced as like anything like that, but you wrote it in a way that I could internalize like his struggle. It was a lot of it was I needed to just sort of break down my own thought process and sort of walk the reader through how that would look in his head step by step, and just the utter exhaustion of a lot of that. I think you did a great job. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I definitely found myself understanding him better than John, but I think that might have just been a motivation <laughs> situation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. John doesn't necessarily think things through as much. His his chapters were really reliant oh. on like <laughs> irony. You really need to be able to it's it's a, it's a lot of looking between the lines to to just sort of on what he's not picking up on. There is everything. a section where we're seeing John's idea that, of course, they'll understand. I won't say more. Oh, yeah. God. But just know that oh, you know, that. John yeah. repeating, of course, they'll oh. understand. And I was like, do you, like, really? <laughs> I think, it's I think almost John, like he's trying to convince himself. Uh, yes. <laughs> I think John can be summed up by saying he's an idiot. John is a dumb, dumb boy. He's a himbo. <laughs> Truer words have never been spoken. So, Connor, I have a question. Lily and I were having a debate earlier, and is John ace or just very tired? <laughs> because I fall on the side that he, at least I read into him as having some very ace characteristics, so, which I appreciated. I like that a lot. Yeah, it's it's a good question, and I, w I wish I knew the answer a little better. <laughs> Um, he's been tired for so long. I don't think even he knows whether what he's got going on is like asexuality or exhaustion. It's definitely environmental to some degree, but I hesitate to give too clear an answer because you're not the first person who said something like this. Mm -hmm. If I like clarified too much about like any sort of intention I had going in, I, I wouldn't want to like take that away from anyone, you know? Mm -hmm. I definitely, I very much tried to make it open to interpretation to what extent which was which i didn't i like i said i don't even want john to necessarily know wh <laughs> whether which of the two it is i don't think john would know <laughs> no yeah. i don't think he does <laughs> he's not great at introspection no he doesn't seem like the sort of person who does a lot of uh thinking about his own sexuality but it is lovely in a way how relatable his experiences are to such a wide variety of people from whatever direction you're coming at it well, before we move on to our perhaps more in-depth conversation about the plot points of the book, Sarah, why should you read The Sword in the Street? If you want dysfunctional relationships with a lot of great representation and also the best character, Aubrey, shaking sense into people, you should read this book. <laughs> I also really love how this book didn't end with the sort of quote-unquote successful revolution it dealt with the idea of, we had this huge change, now what? Which is not something, you know, usually that's the, that's the end, that's the winning stage. So seeing this huge function of social change from a much more realistic perspective was really well done. So definitely read this book if you're looking for those sorts of conversations. To avoid spoilers for The Sword in the Street, Skip to 5055. It's funny.
funny, Connor, earlier you mentioned having a couple different title ideas because I have an alternative title proposal for you. I'm ready. The story of how John pulled his head out of his ass. <laughs> yeah, a lot, of, a lot of it was devoted to that, yeah. <laughs> it, took a, it took a few tries to actually get it out, but he managed it. You know, he got there eventually. <laughs> he got there in the last few pages, just a little bit. He got the first inklings of what he's got to do. <laughs> One of the things that John does sort of eventually pull his head out of his ass about is the is his relationship with Edwin and sort of the way that they are able to communicate and understand each other a little bit better. But goddamn, does it take a long time for them to get there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it took a while. Their relationship is a dumpster fire for most of the book. They have some problems. I had so much fun writing the arguments. <laughs> yeah. The arguments were, they're always my, the just emotionally charged back and forth sort of thing is always my my favorite thing to do. Especially because I really like exploring the insidiousness of like, we're arguing, that means we're communicating. And mm-hmm. just like what you think is good communication versus how the other person actually perceives it. Ninety percent of the book takes place in that space between the two. Even from draft one, the the central question on my mind was just sort of like, can you take two people who have no positive models for what a healthy res- relationship is supposed to be like, and get them to figure it out by throwing them into one? And then it usually manifests with John sort of like not being clear about how he feels a lot of the time, and Edwin like over or underestimating himself to varying degrees depending on what situation he's in. And it's just that the that dichotomy and exploring just the tension and the, the, the different ways of thinking. It was a blast to write, and now I'm trying to think of a way to end the sentence. There's a quote that I think really sums up the relationship very well, which is they finally have a, like a heart-to-heart where they, they both kind of start to understand each other a little bit more. And I can't, I, I didn't actually write down who says what, but someone says we've been talking at each other for so long which I think is a really good it's an apt description of like what you said about they they're arguing so they think they're communicating but that's not actually what communication is that's just shouting at each other yeah it's sort of them posturing their feelings in front of each other and hoping that everyone will pick up on it without actually being clear on like this is how I feel and this is what's working its way inside of me and everything and here's how it's manifesting and here, like just sort of, they're not willing to get uncomfortable until like a lot of the, the stuff in the novel sort of pushes them to. Miscommunication like that can be frustrating as the reader, except we had wonderful characters like Aubrey, who was there to almost act as the proxy for me, at least, to grab them by the shoulders and shake them and say, what are you doing? <laughs> I really appreciate her role in the story. Aubrey was brilliant. I love her so much. Yeah, yeah. Aubrey's just wonderful. She's my favorite. I love her. She was definitely just sort of like an author avatar for me a little bit. She was really like the linchpin that sort of made the book what it was. She barely even existed in draft one. And I think I had to combine like three other characters to get her. Once she was there, I just really loved having her around. Like... When you're stuck in the heads of like two people who constantly either overthink or underthink everything, <laughs> and then like all of a sudden, just the, the one competent woman comes along <laughs> to basically point out that what neither of them are capable of noticing, and it's just it's absolutely my favorite thing to just bring her into a scene, and she's just like, "Cut that out! Don't touch that! Stop! <laughs> you're overthinking it! Shut up!" She was fantastic, and you you kind of need that counterpoint of someone who has their shit together to point out to John and Edwin just how irrational they're being at times. Even she has like her own just sort of emotional bullshit that she deals with a lot of the time. I think the first scene I wound up writing writing her into like as Aubrey and not like these three sort of distinct characters was the scene in the withdrawal chapter where she's just punching the wall. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think that the there's like a moment where like she's just looking at the ruins of her hand and just like slowly looks up at Edwin like, please take me to the hospital. And that was the moment where I was just like, okay, 
I think I've got something here. She seems to be a bit like the sort of middle ground between these two. At the same time, though, I feel like she earned that. Yeah. I Just what she, what we eventually find out she's been dealing with through the entire book. I guess we, I think we know before then, but we've, we've sort of been given hints of her own emotional journey and interior life. And so when she does have that outburst, as the reader, it's almost satisfying instead of frustrating. Yeah. Whereas when John has an outburst, it's like, <laughs> all right, honey. <laughs> She's only hurting herself. Yeah. I feel like she at least has the self-awareness to, to know that she needs to go to the hospital. And like, I don't think John yeah. would know that. <laughs> what do you mean? I'm fine. It's only bleeding a little bit. <laughs> I mentioned earlier how much I like that this story deals with the aftermath of huge social change. And in a sort of similar way, this story deals with, well, it's not similar, but but the plot following the afters of what a, you know, typical story might end at. So there's the huge social revolution. Yay. Happy ending. Except then this story deals with what happens after that. Similarly, A lot of love stories are, yay, they got together, happy ending. But on the flip side, this story deals with actually learning how to be in a functional relationship, like you said earlier, and growing together as people in in a couple and not just starting the relationship as the end goal, which I thought was extremely refreshing. A lot of that was just, I don't necessarily have a lot of just sort of courtship stage stuff to draw on, either like from my reading experience or from from my own life, honestly. (laughs) Like, it's just, especially this this sort of ties back to the whole autism thing. Sometimes Sometimes you just sort of jump into stuff and just see how it goes. And then, especially with, um, without having a lot of the sort of, I haven't read a lot of romance, even before this year. I think I read my first two romances with Fortune School and Legacy of the Brightwash. Uh, was the first time I realized like what romance could be and do. So I didn't even know a lot of the tropes. So it, like going in, I was just sort of like, if I don't know any of the tropes, I don't want to mess with that. But like I do know a lot of tropes about like the, or a lot of the unexamined aspects, especially in sci-fi and fantasy, is like how do you make a relationship work after the stage where they get mm-hmm. together? Exactly. And I, yeah, I just really wanted to explore like, because usually I, I think now that I've actually read romances now, a lot of that stuff in a romance, in the in defense of romance, they usually figure that stuff out before they get together. So, and I think I just sort of um, put them together and then told them to figure it out. I almost did it in reverse. That was only something I realized in retrospect. But, I mean, but that like, happens. Yeah, that was just what I was going to say. Yeah. Like, you, you do find that in life. People who don't have these conversations until after they're like a, in a committed relationship. That's also true. Yeah. And so it was just really nice seeing this extremely common and realistic relationship progression being explored and talked about instead of just, oh, no, happily ever after. He said yes. Yay. <laughs> yeah. What happens after the honeymoon phase and just sort of like exploring a lot of that and just throwing a couple sword fights on the edges. (laughs) No, I, it's funny. I actually would have described this as social conflict slash romance novel just because their relationship was so central to it, at least for me as a reader. Yeah, I, I I wouldn't necessarily call it a romance novel, but it does... Since since the relationship is a main focus of the story, like there's there's a lot of romance in there. It's just unconventional romance, unhealthy romance. It's like a relationship, <laughs> like a relationship novel almost. But yeah. it's like it's less about the glamour of romance and more about like, well, how are we going to afford this next week? What are we doing? How are we going to do mm-hmm. this? It's not like quite as sexy. It's all that, but as such, much more relatable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I I need I've always feel like morally obliged to put to point this out as often as possible. I very much was stealing the premise of um, Swords Point by Ellen Kushner. Mm. It's like almost the exact same setup where just swordsmen are like proxies for rich people, and then there's a, a boyfriend at a nearby who studies at a nearby university, comes from money, 
I read the back cover copy of that book uh, and I was like, I'm going to wait to read this because I need to write it first. <laughs> <laughs> Have you read it? Oh, I've read it since. Okay. It's It's got a lot in common. I can understand why that would put some people off, in fairness. Like, it does have a lot, a lot of the sort of same genetic material. It's almost like, I'm trying to think of a good metaphor for it. It's like Robin Hobb to my George R. R. Martin, which sounds very arrogant now that it actually comes out of my mouth. <laughs> well, it's like how everyone's just rewriting Hamlet. The... You yeah. can have the same story, but do it in a different way. And it's just as valuable. It's interesting because um, I, I read the premise and then I remember going like, now hang on. If you've got these two boys in this kind of conflict, like, I don't think I'd read many male writers writing about that kind of relationship. And I was like, I guess I got to do it myself then. <laughs> I figured if you're going to have like two two men in that sort of relationship, there's a lot. I know a lot of things about being a man. And so I was like, let me bring that perspective to the table. I bet I can come up with something original enough to like use those tropes in a new way. Well, it is interesting. I don't know if this is a an entirely fan fiction demographic, but there have been studies that say most gay relationships are written by women. Yeah, I mean, I would believe it. Uh, which is just sort of a fascinating dynamic. I can, I mean, I can see the appeal, like, of, like, t- of two hot dudes who are completely safe, and you can trust that they're yeah. safe. They're like, I see the appeal of that whole thing. So I don't want to judge and everything, but, like, no, I, yeah, it's just, I, I still wish that the, there was, like, a certain sense of expectation of what society expects of you that I tried to put into this book that I noticed mm-hmm. was absent from a lot of books about men that are written by women, which, again, I don't want to, like, discount any, like, any of that. Like, I think everything in SFF so or anything in all the fiction has like a place it's more about like just engaging with frameworks than anything like everything's going to have its own sort of emotional um and narrative truth regardless of who's writing it it's just that your approach is going to change depending on how you lived in the world experientially absolutely we get to make fun of men writing women so I think you're allowed to make fun of women <laughs> writing men that's fair <laughs> And especially when you have a story that is dealing with men trying to figure out their place in society. And especially, I think there are definitely aspects of toxic masculinity that John is running up against that oh, yeah. as an outsider, you're not really going to have the same understanding of. Yeah, that was actually um, where I got the idea for John's arc, actually, was, uh, are you familiar with the trope of women in refrigerators? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah. But explain to us anyway. The women in refrigerators is basically a trope of um, a female character getting like hurt or killed to fuel the rivalry between two other men. Mm-hmm. And that's sort of what happens with John is like Aubrey experiences this horrifying thing. And he's like, I need to like fight back against this sense of my emasculation by the system by like using her trauma as my ability to sort of center my center myself and um make and like avenge her without her knowledge or consent Mm -hmm. i'd read a lot of stuff about how like that trope is not necessarily always handled well and i wanted to see if i could use that trope and write that sort of character and that sort of headspace in a way where you could figure out why he was making these decisions not necessarily to make those decisions sympathetic but like to sort of get into the headspace of like the contradiction between what the world asks of a lot of men and what most women would ask them to (laughs) to do in that situation yeah he jumps at the opportunity to play white knight yeah but you give Aubrey the chance to explain to him why that was stupid (laughs) which again Aubrey being the best and giving the readers a chance to shout at John through her. <laughs> that was one of the most satisfying scenes to write was just John being strangled while someone's like, you didn't do this for us. Stop it. Mm-hmm. I think the thing about John, though, is that like you you do make it so um, like you can see how he's come to these decisions, even if they're the wrong decisions, like you understand where he's coming from. You're wrong, but I see where the math went wrong. Yes, yeah. exactly. And then you do, like like you say, you, you do get Aubrey shouting. Aubrey's good at that. 
Yeah. She's the voice of reason. Well, and within the relationship between John and Edwin, you know, it's it's not healthy through most of the book, but you do believe that they truly care for each other. They're just not sure how to do that. Yeah. So it's Yeah. It's not like a relationship where you're going, just break up already. You know, I didn't yeah. get that feeling at all. But I also think that Aubrey has a point. She says, like, it's not, she tells Edwin, it's not your job to fix each other. Um, and Edwin's like, no, I can make him better. So you kind of, <laughs> you kind of do, or at least I felt, I was like, Edwin, that's, that's not, that's not what you're supposed to do. That's not, you don't have to make him better in a, like, that's not what a relationship is for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Edwin has his own sort of um, dysfunction and uh, flaws, especially in the relationship where he's not always understanding the way his insistence can work on someone else. And it's not a great combination when he's being very insistent and then the other person doesn't necessarily know how to talk about their feelings, but he doesn't know they know. Mm -hmm. And it's like the whole, that, that, that was the thing, that was the aspect of their relationship, uh, I think the first argument like that comes in around the first 50 pages and it was the thing I was least sure about but also was like most certain that I, I needed to include that was like the sort of central flaw I think I was trying to explore with with Edwin was like his ability to sort of navigate how other people are feeling like his ability to get out of his own head really mm -hmm. And that was the, the sort of arc I was trying to give. I was trying to give him was like, how far out of his own head can he get while still managing everything that his thoughts do to him? We sort of already answered the question: <laughs> How many times did you shout out loud, "Yes, thank you" during Aubrey's scenes? <laughs> that was a lot, closer to five hundred. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, at least once during every time she shows up, I would say. <laughs> Literally. But at the same time, she's not just a prop. I mean, Aubrey has her own agency and like she she's got shit going on, too. So it's not just that she's there to she's she's not just there to prop up John and Edwin. Like she she actually has her own well-rounded character. Which makes it so much better. Early drafts with Aubrey were especially like that was what I was trying to hone in on, because originally that was all she had. The whole reason I had the whole it, it was I didn't have as, as much room to deal with. Aubrey navigating everything she was dealing with um, because we're not in her head. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it I tried to approach through the metaphor of self-harm and just sort of like you see her, the first time you see her, she's she's doing the, the dermatillomania thing where she's mm -hmm. like peeling, peeling the skin from under her fingernails. Which oh, yeah. just give me the shivers, I have to say. I, I dealt with like, that oh, in gross. third grade and that's it's so just gross. as gross in real life, I promise. <laughs> It's, um, she has this whole history of um, self-harm, especially in the, it's most intense in the withdrawal chapters and everything, but um, I tried to use, uh, I had to almost engage with it meta on a metaphorical level, where her he her hand healing is almost supposed to be the sort of metaphor for her trying, her getting to a decent place with everything that's been done to her, and almost realizing what she's doing to herself. She also has my favorite line that, my fa my favorite line that she says has um, nothing to do with either John or Edwin. I think it's in an early chapter, an early chapter at the university about like it's what you get when you smudge the ink that writes the histories. Mm. That was lovely. That was a good line. It was, it was my favorite piece of dialogue, honestly. <laughs> I forgot I wrote it. I saw someone uh, made a graphic of that quote and put it out somewhere. And I remember seeing it and I was like, oh, that's really good. Who wrote that? And I saw the, <laughs> who they tagged it with. And I had forgotten. <laughs> it's been a while since I read it. That's such a nice feeling, though, to be able to look back on your work and think, you know, this was actually yeah, really good. I didn't think I would get there while I was writing it. But I, I think I took my vinyl pass at it. I'd had it done mostly by like March of last year. And then a lot of it was shopping it around to agents and then putting it out into the world when I realized engaging with the unknowns and the slowness of traditional publishing does not necessarily work well when you have the type of dysfunction that I do <laughs> and so I went with self-publishing uh, I think around September and a lot of it was just putting the book together so 
I've had a, I've had a lot more time to reflect on it than otherwise. I think I was only writing it for if I started in October and then I got it back from my editor. Yeah, it would have been only a couple months. So I've had a lot more time to turn it over in my head. It's more time than I actually spent writing it. And it holds up well. I don't know as the author if it holds up, but as a reader, it definitely does. I've definitely gotten to a good place with it. Well, Sarah, why don't you wrap up our discussion with one of our favorite quotes from this book? Okay. So I think that this is Aubrey talking, actually, which uh, makes sense. I'm shocked. (laughs) Shocker, yes. (laughs) Do you think you're the only man who's been a shit? Does that make it right? Of course not. So you make it right. And the only way to make it right is to try and be better. Then you fail and try again. But you can't do that if you're caught up worrying over what's already done and what's already done is not evil. Why must every mistake you make be a sign of evil? Why can't it just be bad? Why can't you just move on and try to be better? Well, Sarah, you and I have discussed this words are weird a little bit, but Connor, I hear you agree with us. Yeah, so I was giving Connor uh, examples of what we meant by words are weird. And I said, in an upcoming episode, which is released by now, we talk about how L-E-I-G-H is pronounced Lee and not Lay, like S-L-E-I-G-H. And it gets me mad every time. And Connor agreed with me. So I said that we're going to we're going to talk about it again. This is part two. <laughs> it infuriated me, honestly, when I first learned, uh, because I first learned because I was talking with Crystal Matar about naming conventions and was asking for permission to rip off her names of uh, what I thought was pronounced Imberlay. I thought um, it was pronounced which, Imberlay too. Right. And I was like, I want to rip that name off. Let me change a vowel. Um, but not, but only the first one. Change it to like a U or something. I don't know. But I was explaining to her that like, the whole appeal of that name is like, it just sounds so fucking cool. <laughs> it just, it like, even the name Imberlay sounds like the name, like, it sounds like the sound a gun would make as it goes off. And I loved it a lot. And then she was like, it's pronounced Lee. You know that, right? And I just, it was like I got hit by like vertigo. Like the world just started (laughs) reeling all around me. I was like, you mean what? (laughs) Since when? It was so cool just a minute ago. Yeah, I'm I'm with you, Connor. Imberly sounds so demure. Mm Mm-hmm. It doesn't hit with the same sort of like, it's not as bad as I love the lay. Mm-hmm. It just, and it's spelled like S L E I G H is pronounced slay. Right? L E I G H should be pronounced lay. It just makes I'm trying sense. To think of any, is there any other like word that ends in those letters that is pronounced lee that isn't like a name? I feel like there probably is. Probably. I don't There'd have to be, right? I don't know. I can't think of any, but I feel like there would have to be. It's not quite the same thing, but I did just Google it. Slight. (laughs) That's an additional pronunciation for the same letters. Wait, but I've always pronounced it slate, like slate of hand. I don't think it's slate of hand. I think it's (laughs) slight of hand. I I was pronouncing that slight. I did do slight. I've I've never pronounced it slight. I pronounce it L-E-I-G-H. Lay. I'm sorry. English That's... language is so cursed. <laughs> it's really just made up. It, it really is. Like, I think I said um, last time that this is more of an English is weird and not words are weird. Yeah. But the words we're talking about are English ones, so. They are, yeah. I started doing this because of Star Wars with the whole Leia. And, like, no one pronounces it, like, Leah or anything. And so I watched it at such an early age. I was just like, well, I assume that's how those words are pronounced when you arrange them like that. I guess it's, is it the addition of a G that changes it? Like, I don't know. I don't. The boring answer is I'm pretty sure that we just yanked those from two different languages, which is why they're pronounced differently. But that's not oh, fun. Right. <laughs> Wait, I just realized that's the explanation. <laughs> that's so simple. That's I don't so like much it. better than anything I could have said. <laughs> Where did it start for you? Like, how did you start pronouncing it that way? Do you do you know? I mean, it's just like slay, S-L-E-I-G-H, which probably brings it back to Narnia. 
Yeah, I could see that. And the White Witch, because I think she rides on a sleigh. But, like, it just, you know, it should be pronounced the same. That's what those words sound like. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to start pronouncing it slee just to bother you. (laughs) (laughs) No. Don't do it. Don't do it, Lily. (laughs) Well, Connor, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Before you go, can you tell us a little bit about your current project? Because I know you're working on something that sounds super exciting. I'm putting it up on um, Patreon at at the CM Kaplan on Patreon, uh, where I'm basically uploading it from like original world building notes to outline through every successive draft every Friday. It's a new book set in this sort of science fantasy world where humanity has just started crawling out of its second apocalypse and there are sonic guns called caterwallers there's swords synthetic horses and contagious ghosts and the plot of the book is sort of like a family of quadruplet royals having a succession crisis most of the drama is kept within one sort of castle where the two firstborn children sort of t- stake the same claim to a, a throne uh, and i put up new stuff every Friday and any, anyone who's interested can sort of watch the book take shape in updates once a week. What stage is it in right now? So if I subscribed to your Patreon today, what would I see there? There have been so far three updates. The first one was uh, 7,000 words of world building from three weeks ago. After that was 36,000 words of outlining. <laughs> and then now we've got the, fir- the first four chapters went up last Friday, and I think that was about 16,000 words. So that's practically a novel already. I'm hyped. I can't wait. <laughs> it's just, it sounds so good. I subscribed. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but like everything that you've said about it, I am, I am so excited for it. It's teaching me to like love my work on a level I did not know was possible just because of all the cool stuff I put in it. I'm really excited about it. It's probably the most ambitious thing I've written ever. You got to work in that um, four-way sword fight in the bear pit, though. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. That's that, that's on the checklist. I'm getting. I'm I'm working there to get there eventually. So where else can you be found on the internet? I'm most active on Twitter at at the CM Kaplan, but I also have a, a Facebook page and an Instagram that I forget to update as well. And then there's there's also there's reviewing books for Fan Addict. That is very infrequent as I'm a very slow reader though. So they do not come often. They're very good reviews. So that makes up for it. Thank you. Well, wonderful. Thank you again for joining us and can't wait to talk to you soon. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate the conversation and everything. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Fiction Fans. Come disagree with us. We're on Twitter and Instagram at FictionFansPod. You can also email us at FictionFansPod at gmail.com. If you enjoyed the episode, please rate and review on Apple Podcasts and follow us wherever your podcasts live. Thanks again for listening, and may your villains always be defeated. Bye. Bye. Bye.